Let's talk through that debinding and centering process. I know a lot of you are most interested in this part. 3D printing is 3D printing, right? So debinding and centering, the basic process is this. You've got your crucible, which in that photo you can see is the little cup inside the kiln. You'll put your AL203 or steel blend powder in the crucible cup. You'll bury your print in that, pack it down and put your crucible in the kiln run the debind cycle, the, the time and temperature profile for that is all on the website in that learn tab as well. That process is gonna take about a day. It's pretty long. So maybe 12 hours from room temperature to room temperature. So you just set it and let it run overnight. Come back the next day, you'll take your crucible out. In the case of bronze and copper, you're going to empty the contents of the crucible and then go through that same packing process again, but this time with magnesium silicate. Bury your bronze or copper part in that magnesium silicate. And now you're going to cover that magnesium silicate with a layer of sintering carbon. The sintering carbon is very important. It's what prevents your part from being oxidized during the sintering process. So you can't use too much sintering carbon. Um, it's meant to be consumed as the oxygen, as it reacts with the oxygen. You can minimize the amount of oxygen the sintering carbon has to manage by covering your crucible then with a piece of kiln paper, which is what you see in that photo. That crucible has a little piece of kiln paper on it or a ceramic plate or something like that, as long as you're not creating a tight seal. Now, in the case of steel, we've buried our print in steel blend and run the debind cycle. And then we're gonna take that out the next day and add sintering carbon to the top, back into the kiln it goes, into the same kiln and run the sintering cycle time and temperature profile. Again, all of that is listed on our website on the Learn tab. Um, glass and ceramic, the difference with those two materials is that I love oxygen, so there's no worry about oxygen during the sintering process, so you will skip the sintering carbon altogether. Now, one question that we get quite a bit is, can those sintering powders be reused? And the answer is yes, absolutely. We've got some information for you on that. Austin is going to put a link to a blog post um, that talks about the sintering powders, reusing them, when to know, when you should replenish those and get fresh powder. Now, some things that can happen during the debinding and sintering process or the most common things that can go awry are pillowing or doming. This is something that Brad mentioned earlier. That's when the gas that's coming out of the part kind of pushes out on the part and creates a dome or causes some delamination between those outer layers. So step number one that we're going to tell you is to really pack your part for the debine cycle. You can think about even ramming in um, that they do in other industries. Just get it nice and tight. Even apply a weight to the top of your crucible for that debine process. So you're, the idea is that you want to compress your part in that ballast. Um, one of the more common errors that we see in sintering is that the part comes out completely black. Well, black means it's been oxidized. If your part comes out black and crumbly, it was oxidized. So question number one that we're going to ask is how much sintering carbon was left at the end? Is there any new looking fully black sintering carbon left over, that's gonna be your key. And if there was not, then absolutely your part was oxidized. And the cure for that is more sintering carbon, um, but then also applying that cover to help limit the amount of oxygen that the sintering carbon needs to manage again. So that's gonna be the key there. Now, what if your part comes out at the end of the, uh, the sintering cycle and it's kind of a glob, it's lost all of its corners, it is unrecognizable. Well, your part has been over sintered and actually melted a little bit. So the good news is you've got some good metal there, right? But that's not really what you wanted. You wanted your part, your, well, you do want good metal, but you also want your shape to be true. So in that case, we're gonna pull back on the time or the temperature. And Brad, talk, talk to us about how the time and temperature work together. 
Right. So in, in centering, and this can be a little confusing because there's really, there aren't hard numbers on the time or the temperature. A good center um, is a combination of those two factors. So you can get your part to center more by either extending the time or increasing the temperature getting the right balance. Um, if you follow the directions on our website, you, you will get, um, you'll get a success early on. And everyone's equipment is different. Yeah. Yeah. And this can be part of the challenge. And this is also true of the oxygen issue that you mentioned earlier. Some kilns are more airtight than others. Um, and you'd be surprised at the amount of temperature variation in the temperature controllers on the kilns. They can vary plus or minus, you know, 20 or 30 F pretty commonly. We see this, we see this come up a lot. So, um, so it can be a matter of a little bit of tweaking. You take a look at the piece um, and we're also, you can send us pictures and we've done thousands of these and at a glance, we can tell you what you need to change. So we're talking about some of the more common issues that happen, but we also don't mean to scare you. The process is really straightforward and, and it's actually very much like cooking, right? Yes. You've got some equipment that you need. You've got some supplies that you need, your ingredients, and there's a specified process that you follow and including time and temperature. So very much like cooking, um, as long as you, if you follow the instructions, you'll have a high, high chance of success. So um, we strongly encourage people just to follow the instructions that we have on the website as written. Once you get that process down, then um, experiment as you choose. One of the benefits of this process is that you have complete control and flexibility over every um, aspect of the process. So once you understand it, then yes, by all means, tweak it, work with it, um, try new things with it. For your first time out, just follow the recipe. Yeah, I'd like to re reiterate this topic. The number one troubleshooting solution we provide is reminding people to follow the instructions more closely. It seems like you should be able to just improvise a little bit, like you're throwing some extra seasoning in it or something like that. But just get get a victory, get a good part, and then start to change the process. Now, um, lots of people asked about aluminum in the registration forms. Aluminum and titanium are different. They are reactive in the presence of oxygen and heat, which is no bueno. So you're not going to be able to center those in standard con. Uh, kiln equipment like we've been talking about. They both require specialized kiln environments in order to do that, that processing correctly. And we're going to add a little bit uh, of a note about tungsten as well. Our Rapid 3D Shield Tungsten Filament is a really awesome special product. It's designed to be a non-toxic 3D printable replacement for lead in radiation shielding applications. And the beauty of this material is that it provides that benefit in its green state, meaning as printed. So you, the, you don't need to go through that heat process to get the benefit of x-ray shielding that you can 3D print on your FFF 3D printer. So that one's a really special. We do have a podcast that gives more information about aluminum and titanium and how they're different. Um, Austin will throw a link to that one in the chat as well. Now, there is some really fun um, divining and centering technology in the works. And one of those that's most exciting to me personally is using a standard household microwave. The general process is the same. You're going to use a ballast material. You're going to bury your print in that ballast material, you're going to run a time and temperature, a prescribed time and temperature profile, you're just using a microwave instead of a kiln. You, what you do need is a special container and you can see the photo in the center of the screen there of that special container, it's lined with metal. So that's what makes it special. It's called a microwave kiln. If you go to Amazon and Google microwave kiln, you'll find a bunch of options there. You can see it, it has a hole in it. That hole will need to be plugged to prevent oxygen from reaching your part. But it's a pretty basic piece of equipment. 
We have some information on our website in the blog section about microwave centering and calibrating your microwave for the process. And you can also take a look at Mr. Highball's YouTube channel. He has done the most work on this process and is beginning to release a step-by-step -step tutorial on it. So he started with aluminum and titanium, which we just talked about being a little more involved with the demining and sintering process. He wanted to go with the most challenging materials first, and he has had some successful parts come out of that. So take a look at that if you're interested in that very exciting topic. Now the sintering chart, this is on our website, the same chart. You'll find this on the Divining and Sintering Instructions page, but it's gonna talk through the different materials, what um, crucible type is great, what refractory, um, what sintering powders you need, uh, the debind temperature, the sub-sinter temperature in the case of steels, which you'll see that in the instructions, and the sinter temperature. So that's all on our website. This is going to, this gives you a basic in, uh, overview of the sintering temperatures you need to reach. If you have a kiln that gets to 2350F, let's say 1280C or cone 10 in pottery speak, you've got it covered. 